Welcome listeners to the Unplug From Sugar Masterclass, where we are giving you the information, inspiration, and community support to unplug from sugar. I am your host, Blythe Metz. I'm a metaphysician and healthy lifestyle expert. Joining me today is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. He is a men's health, weight loss, and muscle building expert. After watching his own dad lose his health and pass away at the young age of 42, Dr. Anthony founded the Fit Father Project to help other busy fathers get and stay permanently healthy for their families. Dr. Anthony holds dual degrees in nutrition and neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania and a doctorate in naturopathic medicine. And he is also a champion bodybuilder, a national champion bodybuilder. Welcome, Dr. Anthony. So happy to be here. Um, I think this conversation we're going to have today is going to be amazing. And it's such a valuable topic. So um, I'm grateful to be here and to be spending time with you, Blythe. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so let's dive right in. What is your perspective on sugar and the diet? Well, you know, I, I think we generally have a, a health and diet industry that wants to find one big culprit that we can point our fingers at about what's going wrong with so many of us in, in terms of like why we don't look and feel good. Um, right. and, and it's a tough thing, right? Because the way we get um, unwell is, is usually multifactorial. There's so many different things. Yet, yeah. if I had to pick one villain to stick a finger at, it would be sugar. Um, and that's particularly why I think this conversation is so valuable is because um, there's a lot of finger pointing around. This is the problem. This is the problem. But sugar really is um, at the root of so many of the health problems we have that, that are not just physical. I'm sure we're going to get into some of the stuff and the research behind the physical impacts of sugar, but also psychological because um, our brains truly are hardwired to have a relationship with sugar um, in that, you know, our ancient ancestors needed to find sugar and sweetness in nature to even survive. So we have this like innate hardwiring to love find sugar. The sugar. Look for the sugar. Right? It's easy to love too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to love. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. Go ahead. That, that's very interesting that we're hardwired for that. Well, so I'll share more about that because I think yeah. it's a valuable place to start. And I, and I, and I think too, um, it might help some people out there who are, who are struggling with sugar addiction. And I, I can say I've been on that spectrum myself in the past, um, not feel as guilty because it's not truly your fault. You know, it's, it's human hardwiring. We are bred and designed to love sweet things because, for our ancient ancestors who had food scarcity, sugar was life. I mean, you find those berries um, or something like that after you've been walking for a while and you don't have food, yeah. man, it, it's designed. Our taste buds want to know sweet and that equals calories and that equals sustenance in life. Except the problem is that we have this ancient machinery that is transported into the modern world where sugar is literally everywhere. So it's really easy to see how this, you know, kind of hardwiring um, goes wrong. It's short circuits, if you will, if we're going to yeah. continue that analogy. Um, and that's why so many people struggle. Um, and, and it's also because we have this, this big, uh, I'll call it the food industrial complex that um, has a financial incentive to, to keep on cranking out sugar because it sells products. So yes. for those of us at this point where we see, it's almost like we took the red pill, like we see yeah. the matrix and now we're just trying to unplug. <laughs> I think the first thing is that we need to get, cut ourselves a little bit of slack and understand that this is an actual problem. There's a biological basis to it. You know, like I'm sure other experts will reference the studies that show that you know, sugar intake activates the same reward centers in the brain as cocaine and heroin. I mean, there are neurotransmitter responses to sugar that are profound. And so it is a tough cookie to crack or to break, if you will, but it's very possible. Um, and, and I definitely have some strategies I'd love to share that we use at the Fit Father Project to help guys break free from their sugar addiction. Um, and so we'll take this conversation yeah, from this point, wherever you want. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear those strategies. I think that's really important. Please share. Okay. Well, I think, I think the first thing when talking about sugar is that we encounter sugar in a way today that has never been there in the past. So we'll go back to this ancient ancestors thing because I think it's an interesting thing to riff on, right? Yeah, so in the past, when humans encountered sugar, we encountered it um, in the context of typically fruits, fruits that get ripe and sweet. Um, but we didn't just get sugar in those fruits. I mean, if you eat blueberries or strawberries, they're sweet, yes, but they also have a lot of fiber and they have other vitamins and minerals. So yes, you're getting sugar, but you're getting it in concert with all these other nutrients. And that is a very different experience for your body in terms of how it metabolizes that than just adding straight extracted sugar to something like 
artificially in terms of we're just adding it in. Even if it's quote unquote natural sugar, it's not existing in its, in its whole um, concert form with fiber and other things. So I think that's where a lot of people get in trouble with a lot of these added sugars and products because our body doesn't know what the heck to do with it. Right. And then we throw on uh, another confusing signal to our bodies where we have a lot of things that are sugar free yet are very sweet, right? We have artificial sweeteners. And for our body, we don't even know what to do with that. You know, our tongue tastes sweet. And for hundreds of thousands of years for humanity, that meant that sugar is coming in, you know, and the blood sugar is going to rise, but then we don't actually get real sugar. So it, the brain kind of hardwires there. So there's so many different issues. Um, so I'd like to unpack a couple things in the conversation today. I'd like to unpack um, maybe why a lot of us experience sugar cravings um, and some simple ways that we can kind of hedge against this hardwiring uh, to break free. Yes. Is that good? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. So the first thing is the, with the guys I support through the Fit Father Project, um, a big part of the sugar cravings ends up being, you know, more of a, um, it initially starts as more of a, a mental stress um, kind of coping tool than it is, and this is what I've experienced in my own life, than it is like truly a physical issue. Like people aren't sugar deficient. We're not going to get sugar because our bodies crave it. And this does happen, you know, when we have nutrient deficiencies, our body tends to crave some of those foods to fix those. But we, no one's sugar deficient. Right. But um, we do know that sugar um, can release all these different happy brain chemicals, the neurotransmitters that make us feel good. So a lot of us find that we have big, long work days. We're getting up. We didn't sleep well. We get the coffee. We run through the day. And then we get home. And at night, we just want to unwind and relax. So people find themselves on the couches. And we have sugary stuff that helps give our brain this kind of this chill out sensation. So the first thing to understand, I think, in, in breaking the cycle of any addiction, you know, sugar being one of them, is to understand what the habit loop that's running around that causes the sugar to get into the system. And so I love this book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. I read it years ago. And it basically says that all habits and or addictions um, have three components to them. There's a cure, a trigger, something that kind of initiates the habit. So let's use smoking as an example. So maybe a smoker um, sees other people smoking outside and they like the social aspect. That visual cue of seeing a smoker might be the cue. Mm -hmm. uh, the routine is actually what you do. So in this case, it'll be eating sugar or smoking the cigarette. And then we get a reward at the end of that. We get a feel-good feeling. We get a little blood sugar spike and a high, something to reinforce that habit loop. So let's keep that in mind. There's a cue, a routine, and a reward. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we kind of start to, I want to invite everyone who's listening to kind of reflect on your own life right now. Um, where is your habit loop around sugar? Mm -hmm. What is your cue? What is it that really starts the, the behavior towards the craving? Is it the feeling of wanting to relax? Is it associated with every time you're on the couch, you have the sugar? Is it seeing those things in the pantry that, you know, you absolutely love? What, where does the cue start? And I think getting clarity around that gives us a little more of a proactive control to kind of break the cycle. Um, and, and, and we at least know what kind of things trigger us. Then we need to know, so right, it, it, it's valuable, right? Because so I mean, yes. yeah. so do, you have stuff to share? do you have stuff to share on that? You want me to keep on rolling? Sure. Do that. Yes, absolutely. I think it, just bringing consciousness to it is, is the primary factor in overcoming it. Yeah. Yes. And everyone's triggers are different. Yours are going to be different than mine. They're going to be different than Sally's and John's. So we need to have awareness and consciousness around what our triggers are. Yeah. And we got to know what our routine is. What are the yeah. things we typically turn to as our sugar sources? Um, and there are some simple things we can do to either substitute healthier routines or, you know, just make sure that the things we typically turn to aren't available in our environment. So like not setting up the willpower battle by not having the sugar in the house in the first place. And that's a strategy we'll get into. Um, and then the reward feeling that we get that kind of completes this habit loop is typically if we feel better mentally, emotionally, at least in the short term, right? At least we feel like when we eat the sugar, we love the sweet taste and we feel relaxed and we feel happy. We get the serotonin and the dopamine are pumping. So when we're looking at these kind of breaking these habit loops, we need to achieve the same feeling. That's the reward that keeps the habit loop intact. How do we create other healthier routines that give us the same exact benefit? And thankfully, when it comes to health, there's a lot of other things we can do that still give us the happy, relaxed, yeah. calm feeling. So, you know, there's a lot of easy substitutions um, we can make. So the first thing I would do is do this kind of mental audit about what are the scripts that are running in your life 
on autopilot that are leading you to these craving battles and, and, and do a little journaling and then um, figure out what those things are and then we can work on changing them. The next thing that I think is really good, anytime we make any kind of powerful decision, um, certainly a powerful decision around getting rid of sugar, is to do a whole house audit, to like clean house, to go through and to reinforce your powerful commitment with um, powerful action in the moment. So what that typically looks like is doing a full audit in your house of what are the sugar sources um, and get those and throw those out. Um, or at least, again, get conscious of them to clear them out. Because ultimately, um, we have so many things that are tugging at our willpower throughout the day. Yes. You know, as simple as the millions of emails, the guy who cuts us off as we're driving to work, you know, a family problem, and all that just whittles down on your willpower. So the time you get home at night, or if maybe it's at 3 or 4 p.m., you're getting that sugar snack at work, your willpower is already depleted. So my thing is like, look, we're humans, we have finite amount of willpower, we can strengthen it for sure, but I would rather help us hedge against the weakness mm -hmm. by removing the willpower battles ahead of time. So like, let's not create the willpower battle, so let's audit and get the stuff um, out of the house. And also um, have a very, very structured and understood plan for when we feel um, anxiety or stress, what do we do? So let's say that's the trigger in this case. We feel stressed because we're overwhelmed with work projects. Um, and the feeling we want is a feeling of calm, peace, happy, everything's okay. Sugar is the link we've been using. How do we create a new, better link? So things like exercise, things like yoga, things like taking a walk out in nature, um, things like reading an amazing book. It might be different for every individual person, but I, I do believe that to break the addiction, we do need completely a very, very structured plan. So every time I feel this way, this is what I do. Um, so if you feel low energy, you know, maybe you get a mini trampoline, you put that in your, in your office or whatever, and you do some rebounding for five minutes. Every time that you would have felt the low energy and turned to sugar, you do something to get your body and your physiology moving. Okay. So I'm using these not as what you should necessarily do, but as, as bigger ideas. picture examples about yeah. what you could do. I love it. I, people like ideas. I think that's great. Yes. Um, Another thing I'll, I'll share on this too is to to do an audit in that audit of the artificial sweeteners in themselves. So an artificial sweetener looks great on paper, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I get the sweet feeling um, and the taste, but it has no calories. So that's got to be good. But what the research really comes out and shows now is that one, all these different artificial sweeteners. So the ones, the common ones like aspartame, saccharin, um, sucralose, like some of these, um, yes, certainly they don't have the calories, but they do negatively impact um, our gut microbiome, which is a fancy term for like the good gut bacteria and the bugs. You might hear the term probiotics that live in our system. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, those, those sweeteners can impair and, and damage the, the diversity and the health of those gut bacteria. And those can lead to a whole host of problems. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be someone on um, this sugar series that's going to talk about the link between digestive health, um, overgrowth of certain bad things like candida and how that leads to sugar cravings. So there's a physiologic basis, but point being is these artificial sweeteners, one, have a double pronged issue. One, they do impact the gut uh, microbiome in a negative way. And two, they are so sweet. Many times these things are like molecule by molecule, 100 to 200 to 1,000 times sweeter than sugar. It depends on what the compound is. And that has a dramatic effect on our tongue itself. And, and what that does is it's almost like if you blast mu music in your room or your office, like at, you know, a level 100 all the time, you know, over there, there's going to be damage. And it's almost like there's so much constant noise that um, if you were to go back and play your music at 30, it might not sound like, you know, anything, right? So the same thing happens with sugar. When we're pounding our tongue in those taste receptors with constant sweet taste, whether it's from an artificial sweetener or whether it's from straight sugar, um, the tongue receptors get desensitized. And that's a big problem because we do want to have a sweet taste, but it is a problem when we are eat something that is naturally sweet like strawberries um, and it no longer tastes sweet to us because we're just so used to being slammed with diet sodas and artificial sweeteners, et cetera. And there was actually a study that showed that um, with a, they, I, they took two people and this was actually at Kaiser Permanente. They have a facility out in California. Um, they had these people do a two week washout where they did no sugar. Um, and 95% of the subjects in the study um, found that foods that they previously thought were not sweet now tasted sweeter. 
So in two weeks, the tongue can really reset some of his receptors so that things that should be sweet to us now taste sweet again. And that's great because that means that um, we can have a healthy relationship with some natural sugars that are found in healthy foods like blueberries, et cetera. Um, and, and our body can, can enjoy those. And it's not like we have this muted response. So Ultimately, my goal for everyone would be a healthy relationship to sugar. And that means that, hey, you can have sweet taste in, in your body. Um, ideally, it comes from the form of, of where the sweetness comes in nature. So some healthy fruits and veggies. Um, and, it's, and you're getting that sugar in the body in the context of also getting the fiber and the vitamins. Um, and sugar is just one of the many tastes that you're used to experiencing. You know, you also experience spicy and bitter, et cetera. So it might seem kind of weird on this, you know, talking about sugar addiction um, and breaking the cycle to talk about, you know, tongue receptors, but it is important and it does play a factor. Um, so that's something that we definitely want to reset as well. It's amazing how quickly the body responds, isn't it? Like you said, two weeks. I mean, it's, it's, our bodies are so powerful and they, they, they want us to treat them how they want. Right. And so they respond quickly. Um, which is such good news. Completely. And I, I have some more stuff. I'm just, I'm just like all gears are firing right now because yeah, this is please. such an important topic. Yeah. Another thing is, is, is anyone out there is looking to break a sugar addiction that is very, very valuable um, is to improve your diet. And I use diet not in the term of like weight loss diet necessarily, but just a healthy diet, the foods you're eating to improve it in such a way that it keeps your blood sugar levels stable. So I like to explain that. Yeah. It's, it's an easy way to think of that your, your energy levels are proportional to your blood sugar levels. I should say the stability of your blood sugar levels. So when your blood sugar levels are all over the place, it's like a roller coaster of like highs and lows, your energy follows in that suit. So what we ideally want um, is a constant level of energy. And what that means is that we want to maintain a very constant balanced blood sugar. And so one of the fastest ways to screw up your blood sugar levels is certainly to eat a bunch of sugar you know, it spikes your blood sugar, your body goes like, uh Oh, here comes the sugar. And it responds by pumping out a ton of insulin to clear that sugar out from the bloodstream and put it into cells, muscle cells, fat cells, etc. And then you get this dip. And then what do your, what does your body do when it dips? It's like, Oh crap, we need more sugar. So you get a hunger sugar craving again. So this is like a physiologic loop that a lot of people get stuck in when they have sugar in the diet and the roller coaster energy levels go. So another question we need to ask ourselves is how can we stabilize our blood sugar? And the best way to do that, especially when you're detoxing from sugar, is to include more healthy fats and more healthy proteins in your diet. These two things will help slow the release rate um, of sugar in your system and keep that blood sugar levels very stable so that your body doesn't have this um, physiologic urge to get hungry and crave sugar to balance out the blood sugar because it stays stable all the time. And get this, mm. there is a huge difference between eating a package of gummy bears and a package of gummy bears with a tablespoon of olive oil dramatically different meals um, for your body from a physiologic perspective. We'll break this down. And a lot of people don't realize this because they seem like they'd be pretty similar, right? right? But the thing is, what healthy fats do, something like olive oil, is it slows the, uh, basically the release rate of sugar. It slows down the whole digestive process. Um, and it'll make those gummy bears that are still not a good choice, but they'll time release gradually, at least a lot more gradual than they would without the olive oil. Mm -hmm. So this is a pro tip and an action item. Um, when you're having your meals, make sure you're including the healthy fats, the nuts, the seeds, the olive oils, coconut oil, avocado, these good healthy fats, because that's going to slow the release rate of the food, no matter what you're eating, which is ultimately going to lead to more stable blood sugar and less sugar cravings. So I still say ditch the gummy bears, but I will, I still want to hang by the fact though, that including the healthy fat with the gummy bears is going to lead to a dramatically different response, um, in terms of your blood sugar. I mean, this varies by individual, but it is a really good uh, rule of thumb I like to share with people. Yeah, that's wonderful. And when you're talking about using oils for in your meals, are you just talking about raw oils or are you talking about cooked oils too? You know, it depends. And I think it's a value. That's a, that's a separate valuable conversation, right? About smoke points of oils. But um, I would say, hey, you know, anytime you can get high quality raw oils, like your extra virgin olive oil, your macadamia nut oil, your avocado oil, your walnut oil, these really good oils. That's amazing. But um, it's not just the oils, it's the fat itself. So even, you know, and this would be on the other end of a spectrum, we have plant-based, beautiful plant-based oils. And let's throw out like something like a fatty ribeye steak. If we did the fatty ribeye steak, um, which has a lot of you know, animal fat plus the protein, and we paired that with the gummy bears, we would still have this blunted blood sugar spike response. So mm -hmm. I, we want to have healthy fats. Yeah. 
and we want to minimize the sugar, but it's really not just like the oils themselves, but the fats in the oils. And, and all oils are not created equal. This is, and we could probably do a whole oil summit, yeah, right? And, sure. and talk about that. Um, but the point being, I want to, I want to hear from a physiologic perspective, it's the fat that really helps us. So let's get some good fat in the diet. And so what I recommend, hey, you can add, um, you can certainly cook with healthy oils. You know, things like uh, virgin coconut oil and avocado oil are great medium to high heat oils, particularly the avocado oil. Um, and just start incorporating more healthy fats in your food. It could be sprinkling some nuts and seeds on a salad. Um, it could be putting a half an avocado on, on the side of whatever meal you're having. Um, and that's going to help keep you more full. You're going to probably eat less over the long run because those healthy fats are beautiful for controlling hunger. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, that's going to lead to um, feeling more satisfied and uh, having less cravings for sugar. Now, do you think that when you eat, because when you eat like a date or something that's a high concentrated sugar, but it is a whole food, it has all the fiber and the other nutrients that help it um, assimilate without spiking the glycate. Do you, do you think that those kinds of sugars make your body go up and down all day too, or no? So this is fascinating, new fascinating area of research. We, we, you know, let's, let's rewind to what we thought around 10, 15 years ago. We got that whole glycemic index chart, right? Which is right. basically a chart that shows like how any individual food, how much it spikes your blood sugar. And we gave them ratings. And we started with the white bread. We give white bread a rating of 100. And we're like, based on white bread, how much do these various different foods spike our blood sugar? And you can look at these tables online. And they're a good rule of thumb, but what we learned is that it's so individual and it's not fully the case. One, we don't eat foods in isolation. So yes, if you just had a mono food meal and you just ate dates, maybe the, the blood sugar curve, um, on the glycemic index is, is fairly predictive of what your response will be, but we've even learned that if you feed two different people a bunch of white bread, um, which you know is, is ultimately ends up being very high in sugar, at least when it's broken down the body, a complex carb turning into, turning into sugar, very refined, um, people have very different glycemic responses, very different blood sugar responses, and it's largely based on the different uh, gut microbiome and the probiotics that exist in these people's bodies. We have varied responses to the same foods. So white bread spikes blood sugar in some people, does not do it in other people. Um, and so it's not as simple to just say that dates are gonna affect you the same way they're gonna affect me. Um, I would always recommend, as a good rule of thumb, to include healthy fats anytime I'm including you know, some, some of these uh, more sugary foods. And there are certain fruits that I personally think are better than others, just like on paper, in terms of their, the, they have a, the composition of their sugar is of a lower glycemic index, which I still think is a, a valuable rule of thumb to do. So I'm a huge fan of all the different kinds of organic berries. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of, uh, personally, it's just a weird, I love kiwis. It's like a thing. But like, if there is a super fruit kiwi. category, that is great is, is probably like the organic berries that tend to have most of the phytonutrients. The sugar is um, pretty slow um, releasing relative to something like a pineapple um, or maybe a banana. And they typically have, you know, better, more beneficial plant compounds in them. Nice. So what else would you like to um, share with our listeners that are being so brave and unplugging from sugar? Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is another huge thing. Um, I want to talk about sleep. Because a lot of people do not equate and understand um, how linked sleep and sugar cravings are. Nice. So when our body, um, you know, sleep is, is essentially the domino that controls the whole cascade of different hormones that ultimately dictate um, our appetite, our hunger levels, um, all these different things. And when we're in a chronically sleep deprived state, which for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to define as less than seven hours, um, your body is kind of in a, this fight or flight mode. And we hear that a lot. And one thing that happens is cortisol gets, rises after a, a day of low sleep and generally just living high stress life. And cortisol is a stress hormone. We need it. It often gets villainized, but you know, our body needs cortisol to, to make things happen. But one of cortisol's actions is actually to stimulate appetite because it's like, hey, we're in fight or flight mode. We need energy. So cortisol works on certain brain centers to stimulate appetite. So if you're sleeping, um, you're not sleeping properly, you're kind of pushing uh, the rock uphill because the physiology and the hormones that are released due to poor sleep will ultimately lead to more sugar cravings, period, than if you slept well. And get this too, after a night of sleep, your body processes sugar and carbs very poorly. Um, we have uh, a blunted, um, uh, I guess like a, uh, an elevated insulin response to sugar and blood sugar stays very high after a night of poor sleep. So let's say you had these gummy bears again. You have those gummy bears after a day of great sleep and you have those gummy bears after a day of poor sleep. 
Again, very different responses. After the day of poor sleep, that blood sugar is going to stay high for a long time. The insulin that gets released to get clear that sugar stays high for a long time too. That blunts your fat burning and causes a whole host of problems. So if we're looking here at kind of looping back to the beginning of this conversation, is we want to, want to find the root causes of why we're having sugar issues. And a lot of it ends up being, you know, hey, maybe sugar is a way we're coping with stress in our life. Mm-hmm. And so we also need to look at what are our stress outlets and what are the things we're doing that are making our bodies, you know, perceive more stress and poor sleep is one of them. So anything we can do to improve sleep quality is ultimately going to translate indirectly to reducing our sugar cravings and in, in improving how our body functions when we do um, encounter sugar from healthy fruit, for example. Oh, that's so important. Such an important factor that we really don't think of, or I never thought of it, right? I mean, that's yeah, like, totally. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Um, we're out of time, and I could talk to you for hours about this. Thank you for being so knowledgeable. I do want to let our listeners know that you have two awesome free gifts for them. Um, listeners, those links will be below this interview in the email. Dr. Anthony is giving away their one-day meal plan for busy fathers, which I imagine is also for busy mothers and busy anybody, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the 24-minute metabolism boosting uh, workout, which sounds awesome. Yeah, so oh, I'll, I'll chat about those gifts. They're they're amazing. You know, at this point, over 100,000 people have used both those things because they're they're great resources. Um, in the meal plan, we'll cover some of the stuff we covered, but in a practical what to eat for breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner. And even though it's for the Fit Father Project, this works for anyone listening. Um, and for the amazing ladies out there who are stepping up and taking charge of their health, um, we hear you, we see you. We started with the Fit Father Project. We're releasing a women's brand called the Fit Mother Project. So you will have your own dedicated meal plan soon, and I cannot wait. Um, but definitely check out those resources because it'll give you some some practical like do this, not that stuff. And um, and again, the exercise, we talked about how important finding healthy stress uh, release valves are um, to kind of unplug from sugar and how getting our bodies moving more is going to help. Um, the workout's simple, you know, 24 minutes. It doesn't have to take a long time and you can really help reset your body. Um, and so I recommend you check those out and I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to help everyone out. I hope everyone's uh, walking while they're listening to this and, and just making good strides with their health. And I really respect everyone who's taking time out of their busy day to learn this information, to improve themselves. It really warms my heart and it's why I spend the time doing these things. Oh, I, I echo that. That's awesome. And I appreciate you so much, Dr. Anthony. And this is this 24 minute metabolism boosting workout. If you guys haven't seen Dr. Anthony yet, check out his videos. He knows what he's talking about. I'm really excited to get this for myself because you you have this dialed in about how to really get the most out of your body. So we really appreciate this. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Um, We will see listeners tomorrow for another inspiring episode. Until then, we hope you enjoy unplugging from sugar. Bye-bye.